Well, hello everybody, and welcome to another episode of Tony's Messy Wood Shop. In all seriousness, it's a little bit cool today. Had to turn the heater on for the first time of the year, and just about an hour north of us, uh, they got their first snow of the year, so bummer. So, looks like we're going to be breaking out the winter clothing here pretty soon. Anyway, being this time of year, I guess it's to be expected. So today, as we talked about in our last video, we're going to work on building a new case, a new wooden case, for the Marantz 2500. Now before we start talking about the woodworking and all this, I'd like to make a couple comments on that video I did on troubleshooting the hum issue with the 2500. I got a lot of great feedback on that last video. and it really gave me a good feeling about where we are with the one that I have on the bench. I did have someone who is an owner who is about to do a restoration on his 2500 and he claims he has an unmolested unit to the best of my understanding that has not been serviced, nothing has been moved around in it or anything like that and lo and behold it actually has that same slight hum problem. So from the factory there is a possibility that some of these may have come out with a slight hum problem. So that's something that we're going to look into a little bit more to kind of maybe see if uh, some of the things that can cause that. But I'm fairly confident that this is something that because of the high gain of that receiver and because of the fact that it doesn't have an attenuation switch for the volume, uh, it's just susceptible from its by design to having a little bit of hum if you're not really careful with how things are grounded and so forth. And actually right now, the right channel is 100% hum free. You can put your ear right against the speaker, you can't hear a thing. The left channel, if you put your ear literally against the speaker, you can just barely hear something faint in the background to the point where I don't think it is going to interfere even in a listening environment I don't think it's going to be a big deal even during a uh, very quiet passage uh, in a classical piece or something I don't believe that it's going to interfere the most demanding audiophiles probably wouldn't buy that type of system in the first place an integrated receiver no matter how good it is because there are certain inherent things that are going to come along with that type of design no matter whose it is so for what it is I think it's good it's perfect it's the way it needs to be but I really appreciate all of the wonderful comments I learned a lot of things from working on this hum problem I also learned that I can easily cause a hum problem by not doing my homework and not checking over my work enough so Again, it, it was a good lesson for all of us, and it seems like a lot of you learned a lot of good information, so I'm really glad I posted that video. That being said, we're going to move on now and try to make this as beautiful of a piece of audio gear as we can. It sounds beautiful now. It performs beautiful. We are now going to make it try to make it look beautiful. So if you recall, this thing was pretty battered up when we got it originally and go check the early video series where I did the restoration and really this case was completely beyond repair it was badly cracked as you can see up here uh, the wood its particle board with a very very thin veneer walnut veneer uh, cover on it so it's really not going to be repairable now we're going to have a couple little challenges with this uh, first of all, this is a pretty thick piece of wood, as you can see. So this is not going to be a standard uh, three quarters of an inch. And yes, we're going to talk inches in the wood shop, and we're going to talk millimeters when we're at the workbench, <laughs> just to confuse everybody. But this is a, a three quarters, not a three quarters piece of wood. This is more like either a seven eighths or what we call a four quarters. And yes, in woodworking, we talk in terms of eighths and quarters of an inch. So one inch thick board a lot of times woodworkers will refer to that as four quarters and inch and a quarter would be five quarters 
yes, it's an old tradition in woodworking, and yes, we have some crazy ways of talking about things, but that's really what it is. So this looks like it's going to be four quarters uh, wood. So we need to have something that's about this thickness. The other challenge is this piece here, which is the top cover, it's just a beauty cover. You can see it's just a lattice work. This appears to be solid wood. It might be plywood, but I can't really see any plies in it at all. And it doesn't, it appears that it may be hardboard or something like that that's been veneered. But it's really hard to tell. It almost looks like solid wood. But if you can tell, it's very thin. So we're talking, this is maybe about a quarter of an inch thick, uh, six and a half, seven millimeters. And you can see it has a very paper thin lip on it. It's like a tongue. And that tongue fits into this groove and that's, that's kind of how it holds the whole thing together. So we have to kind of recreate this, but wood does not come in this thickness. And if we just planed the wood down, we would waste a whole bunch of very valuable lumber. So we're going to look at a technique called resawing. And we're going to resaw a thicker board into thinner boards like this to make this up using the bandsaw. So maybe that'll be something uh, interesting if you've never seen such things. So we're going to do get into that a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about the type of wood we're going to use. And skip ahead if you don't want to hear this. I'm going to give a little talk about kind of my feelings about the species of lumber that you use and material you use when making a wood project. I'm not a big fan, typically, of using a pigmented stain. In other words, getting stain that actually changes the color of the wood. Now, an oil-based varnish or an oil-based finish that may darken the wood naturally a little bit when the oil soaks in, I don't have a problem with that. But what I typically try to avoid, if I'm making something that's supposed to be, you know, furniture grade like this, it's not a low end, like a higher end piece of woodwork, I will try to pick a species of lumber that matches the color that I'm trying to achieve. It's a lot easier to just buy a piece of light colored lumber, like maple or pine or poplar, and then put a pigmented stain on it. Same thing with wood that changes with age, like cherry. Cherry gets a really beautiful burgundy kind of reddish color as it ages. Some of them can actually turn more of a brownish color when they age. Different woods are made different ways. In other words, they have different types of chemicals in the wood naturally occurring that reacts with certain elements in nature. So for instance, if you had a piece of cherry and you took that cherry lumber and it was completely fresh, you just cut it out of the tree and you, you planed it down into a board and it's kind of a light color when it starts out. Uh, almost a light color like pine or poplar, kind of a amber or even lighter. If you took it out and sit it, sat it directly in bright sunlight for a few hours, you would notice that the, the wood would change colors. It actually darkens, and that's because of the tannins and certain chemicals that naturally occur in that species of wood. Same thing with oak. There are different types of oak lumber. There's white oak and red oak are the two main ones that, that we do use for woodworking. Red oak has a lot of tannin in it. Or, I'm sorry, white oak has a lot of tannins in it. The red oak is the typical kind you find at like a, you know, a, a hardware store or a home improvement center, what you use for wood trim and things like that. Red oak typically doesn't change color a whole lot and doesn't react with, the, with anything in the air, nor does it react with sunlight a whole lot. White oak, on the other hand, is the type of, of oak that will actually turn a dark brown. It reacts with certain chemicals, so sunlight will affect it a little bit over a long period of time, it'll darken. Whereas if you use, for instance, ammonia, so you could just take a little pie plate, fill it with ammonia, put the wood on the table, 
and then just make a little plastic tent with that little pan of ammonia and the ammonia fumes will react with the tannins in the white oak and that white oak will turn a dark chocolate brown. Now why am I talking about all the chemistry of how woods darken and how different things affect it? Well what happens is if you put finish like stain like a like a, a pigmented stain where you're actually trying to achieve that color right away so you take cherry lumber fresh with no you know that hasn't been aged yet and you put cherry stain on it it will simulate that coloring that you get when the wood is aged and it looks really really good when it leaves the wood shop the problem is if it's solid cherry wood and it hasn't been aged yet as it ages it will naturally darken and that darkening will mix with the pigment of your stain and it'll actually make the wood look dull. You'll lose the, the grain pattern in it. It'll even, some of them can even get so dark that they look almost black or really, really dark brown. And it's not something that I like. I want the wood to age naturally. That's the way a long time ago, a lot of the master woodworkers, they, they used the species of wood that they wanted and they knew how it would age with time. And it's kind of a neat thing to watch the piece of furniture transform over the years as the natural elements of nature darken the wood. So that's why I kind of like to work with different species of lumber than just using your basic, you know, hardware store lumber and putting stain all over it. So we're going to use a unique type of exotic hardwood today called Paduk, P A D A U K, I believe is how it's spelled. And yes, I am not a spelling student, I'm electronics, but I'll try my best for y'all. So let's take a look at this wood and see what it looks like. So here you see the stock that we're going to be using to make this. And I went into my uh, wood, wood end cuts bin. I have a bin full of just end cuts that you use for little pieces of trim. I always save, especially the expensive exotic wood. And what I did is I cut this in half. This is a very reactive wood, like we were talking about. And at first, it can either be very beautiful or very ugly, depending on your tastes. So what I did was, this wood's been sitting around for probably 10 years. And it's been in a covered environment, so it's been darkening very slowly. But it has darkened a little bit. But what I did was I cut this piece in half. I'm going to show you up close what it looks like inside. If you look, I hope this focuses, you can see that when you cut the wood and you expose fresh lumber, it's almost an orange color. And some, some boards, individual boards, can be very orange. And there goes my phone. So you can see and what this wood will do is, in time, it will age and it'll get a very dark, almost like a chocolate brown color, really pretty color, and it will maintain the grain pattern. In other words, those little stripes that are in there will actually darken at the same rate that the, the lighter sections do. So the dark grain stays dark and the lighter grain stays light. But it changes from that kind of orange tinted wood color to a very beautiful dark brown color with time. And this is one example of what I'm talking about. Another one here is a piece of wood. This is called Purple Heart. This is another exotic hardwood. And this one's been cut for a while, but if you notice, it has almost a purpley kind of tint to it. And some of them can be very very purple color and again these woods will change and darken with age as well now there are things that you can do if you like this color and you want to maintain it you can actually put certain finishes on it like certain types of varnishes that have ultraviolet light inhibitors in them so it has UV blocking almost like putting sunscreen <laughs> like you put on your skin like sunscreen for for lumber and it'll slow down the process of that coloring that it'll take many many years for it to darken so again 
the the species of lumber can control the coloring and so forth and that's what I like to do it's that's part of the art to me is choosing the correct lumber for the project that you're building and letting the lumber show itself because each board is unique every tree that you cut every piece of lumber that you that you get is a one of a kind and it has a certain character to it in the grain pattern and so forth and it tells a story and I don't want to cover that up with stain <laughs> so that's what we're gonna do so anyway um, that's my long dissertation on choosing a type of lumber I hope that was interesting to those of you who really don't do a lot of woodworking there's a lot that goes into it it's very interesting that's one of the reasons I love what woodworking and one of the reasons when I come down here there's no electronics here I have a little really beat up radio <laughs> that I listen to sometimes but that's the only electronics I have down here um, everything is tools for woodworking and it's quiet and I really enjoy it this is my quiet place I can come down and work on this type of thing and it's it's really therapeutic it's cool so anyway let's get started on this and see what we can do to lay this out to be able to make this cover so looking at this and yes my head's cut off because I want to kind of focus down here on the bench what we're doing but if you look down here this is just ever so slightly thicker than this wood but the good thing is the stock that we're using is already finished on two sides in other words it's been planed and everything down into you know a flat smooth somewhat smooth board and uh, this tiny little bit of thickness difference is not really going to make that much difference it doesn't really matter and since this is hardwood instead of particle board it is going to be much much sturdier and stronger than this now another thing you have to be aware of when you use solid wood for a a receiver case like this or an amplifier case when you use hard wood you have to understand certain types of wood will move with changes in temperature and humidity so as as you get more and less humidity in the air and the temperature changes the wood will actually absorb the moisture from the air and it will expand and then as it dries out it'll contract and that movement can cause the wood to crack uh, over time certain wood is less susceptible to that so for instance this Paduke has natural oils in it so it's not going to move nearly as much if we were to use something like maple or cherry or oak or especially walnut black walnut they have they can have a lot of movement in them with changes in environment so that's another thing you have to look out for whenever you're going to use uh, a type of lumber for you know solid wood for a case so hopefully I have this all in the camera now and you can see how I've laid this out and then I've taken you know a thick carpenter's pencil and you can also use chalk or whatever I'm just rough marking this and I mark the outline of these two pieces and I also remove these little plastic grills which are still in absolute mint condition they're perfect which is a good thing we can reuse them and I've now picked the grain pattern that I like for both of these and the the face that I'm going to use so this is where it is and when we take this away we have our outlines I don't know if you can see on the camera my lines and so now that we know what pieces we're going to use, we're now going to cut these out. Now again, uh, there's two different trains of thought with this. When you do things this way, you're going to get the best look and the best grain pattern of the wood. However, in doing so, you see how these are spaced apart from here to here and from here to the end. So we are going to have some waste that we normally would not have if we wanted to be less wasteful of the wood if this was extremely expensive and valuable rare grain pattern of wood which this is not it would be more beneficial sometimes to kind of trade off the grain pattern so that you don't waste the expensive wood now these pieces here are going to still be big enough 
here and here to the end that I'm going to be able to still use them. They're still going to be useful pieces of wood, so I'm not too worried about it. But what we're going to do now is we're just going to cut this out and just get it roughed out into its rough shape, and then we'll refine it and do all the uh, get it eventually down to match this. Hopefully you can see me here. And uh, what we're going to do now is this board is too wide to fit on my miter saw. So what we're going to do is we're going to cut it on this miter sled that I have, this crosscut sled that I made. And it's going to allow you to cut a lot wider board. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it about a finger's width from the blade to the line that I cut so that I have enough room to kind of work with it a little bit. And again, we will refine this down to its final dimensions uh, once we get everything cut to rough size. So let's do that now. Always wear our safety glasses. And uh, one more thing. I am going to go and put on a respirator for this. Even with the dust collection, I have very good dust collection in the shop. Paduk has a chemical in it that is somewhat of a skin irritant. Well, it's not somewhat, it is. If you breathe, the, it first of all, it makes very powder fine dust. Unlike normal wood that will make coarse sawdust when you cut it, this stuff tends to, to be a lot finer dust. That orange dust, or red dust as they call it in woodworking, is notoriously skin irritant. Your nose will bleed if you breathe this stuff. It won't kill you, but it's not good for your skin. It, most people are allergic to it. It will cause irritation of your nasal passages. And I will tell you, the first time I worked with this, one of my close friends went to college and he has a master's degree in fine woodworking. And he has his own shop for uh, furniture restoration. And he works with this stuff a lot. And uh, I was telling him about, about a project I was building first time I ever used this. And he said, be careful of the red dust. And I'm like, red dust? What are you talking about? And as it turns out, he told me about you know how this stuff is. And he says, I'll tell you, if you don't listen to me, you're going to, your nose will be bleeding. Whenever you're sanding it and whenever you're machining it, wear a respirator or a dust mask. Um, it's not the fumes, it's just the dust. So even a paper mask that blocks the, the dust from getting into your nose, uh, you'll be all right. Now, I've never had any problem with my skin. There's no problem with that. But it is, it will irritate your nasal passages and your nose will bleed. Mine bled. I didn't listen to him. I paid the price the first time. I will never do that again. So let me go get my uh, respirator and we'll be right back. All right, let's get our dust collection started.
It's a pretty good match. So now we have to kind of work on machining out this center part right here. And uh, that's going to be a little bit more challenging to get it to be real straight. So uh, we'll deal with that here in a moment. Okay, I just wanted to give you a little example of what that red dust looks like. I've drilled some holes in this and just kind of cut out rough cut the center out and we're going to use our uh, router table to clean this up and I'll show you how I do that in a minute but it just kind of shows you what this stuff looks like it just gets all over everything and it gets it's really when you cut it the funny thing is it's deceiving it has a, a really sweet floral kind of smell to it when you cut it and you kind of enjoy the smell of it <laughs> So you tend to not think about putting on dust protection until your nose starts to burn and your throat starts to itch because the stuff is kind of an irritant. Again, once the cutting is done, uh, the smell itself is not bad. It's just if that dust gets up into your nose, that's when it kind of will irritate you. So um, just interesting stuff, that's all. I'm not trying to scare anybody or anything like that. This is... I work with this a lot and never had any problems, so I just wanted to share with you. Okay, we're now going to trim this really crooked, rough cut piece uh, down straight using the router table. So I have a straight bit, and what we're going to do is the bit rotates this way, so it's going to cut the wood this direction. So what we're going to do is we're going to feed the wood into it that way. So we're going to plunge cut this down and then move it across here and then come out. And it'll make this totally smooth. So let me get things set up here. And... And smooth so now we're going to do that to the other three sides on both of them and that opening will be a perfectly cut opening well here it is all done or at least ready to sand and put the finish on and we cut the dado in the top and it pretty closely matches the old one Here's the original one. 
you can see same potatoes and yes there is a left and a right they are different so these are mirror images of one another so this one's one side if I get this one it matches this and you always have to kind of watch that um, whenever you do this so these two are the same and they kind of match up I think so there we go and I'm about ready to uh, start into the top part which is over here and if we look over here this is a thin piece and you can see it has some really thin dados so we're going to have to mill down some really thin paduke this is probably about a quarter of an inch thick so uh, I think what I'm going to do is instead of making one solid piece and cutting it out like this I'm going to piece mine together I'm gonna to make two rails here and then I'm going to make this little lattice work and I'm going to kind of tongue and groove them together so you will see some seams here but we'll try to make it look a little bit interesting how they piece together well it's another day another cold day and we have the heat going and uh, we're back down in the shop and this is kind of where we are right now and just doing a dry fit of these side panels onto the cover of the uh, 2500 Marantz and everything's looking really good so the next thing we have to do here if we walk around is we have to now build this top part and I don't know if I'm going to do it exactly the same as this I may just do an open frame all the way around and not put the cross lattices in there I'm not sure yet how I'm gonna do this but essentially what we're gonna do you can see how that kinda of fits in there like that and I don't the slots aren't quite as cut down but you can see how that's gonna fit in there and uh, here's our problem the wood that we have right now <laughs> is a lot thicker than this so you see how thin this top is it's only about a quarter of an inch thick and we see this now we can run this through the thickness planer which is over here and we could plane it down and that would waste a whole bunch of wood but we're gonna do a technique called resawing and we're gonna take this board and we're gonna cut it down the middle we're gonna slice it open and cut it into two pieces and then finish plane it down to this thickness that's going to do two things number one that's going to save a whole lot on our wood because we're basically going to get two boards for the price of one but the other thing it's going to do is when these open up the grain pattern is going to be mirrored on either side that's called book matching so it's actually will make the grain pattern look really good on on the top so in order to do this uh, the first thing I want to do is kind of plane a straight edge on there on the jointer we want to joint that edge and then we're going to come back and I'm going to show you the, our setup for how we resaw this board okay so what you see in front of you now is called a band saw and the reason it's called a band saw is because it has this big metal band type blade that goes around this big flywheel here and it's all motorized and the advantage of a bandsaw is that it can cut very wide boards so you can see we have this fence set up with this special auxiliary fence called a resaw fence and what it's going to do is it's going to hold the board parallel to this blade and we're going to run that board through here and split it into two boards so let me get this set up on the tripod and we'll cut it okay the first thing we want to do is we want to mark a little scribe line across it just to have a so that we can steer it basically what we're going to do is as we're cutting through here 
we're going to make just ever so slight adjustments back and forth to keep that blade tracking on this line so we can cut it as close to perfectly uh, parallel as we can. Now it's not going to be perfect and that's why these two outer surfaces are parallel to begin with so that we have a reference when we finish planing it down. So you'll see all this um, when we get further along. Let's cut this and see how we can do. You can see now how these are book matched now. See how the patterns kind of work together? So that'll make a really nice looking uh, set of rails. So now what we have to do is it's still a little bit too thick, as you can see. So now we're going to have to plane them down with the planer, which is no big deal. We'll just run them through the thickness planer and bring them down to their final dimension. That's easy to do. see how we did. This should be about the same thickness and there it is right on. Okay so we have four nice pieces of properly dimensioned lumber and they're all nice and book matched. So we should be able to do something like this and something like this. I'm not mistaken, and get a really nice looking pattern. Well, I don't know how long it's been since the last video clip. This is probably going to be the longest video in the making that I've ever done, and not just because it's anything complicated, it really isn't. It's just that I've just not had a lot of time to do any side projects because of work and so forth. But, uh, let's get you caught up with where we are. I had a little bit of time this afternoon and I was able to get into the shop and I was able to make the top part. You can see here's the frame I made and it's going to go on the top of our cover over here. And uh, I did something very unique with the joinery is how I put it all together. And I'll show you here how this goes together. So if you notice, these side pieces are angled 
and they have uh, a very special kind of joint on the end and these are called mitered tenon joints so this end has a 45 degree cut and then you have the little tenon cut here on the end and then on the other side there's a 45 degree cut inside here like a slot and that's called the mortise and it's a very strong joint when you glue it together and it fits together just like that so you can see really nice and it will never come apart when you glue this up now in order to do this you can cut these by hand and you can use a special saw uh, let me see if I have one here Hold on a second. So you can use a saw like this and you can hand cut it. This is called a back saw or a tenoning saw. And you can actually, if you really have a good hand and are very steady and have a nice jig to hold this, you can cut these slots. You can cut this part down here but you have to have a really steady hand and then you have to fine tune it with a file and, and with a chisel and so forth. Um, or you can, if you have a table saw, you can use a special jig called a tenoning jig and that's what this thing contraption here is. And if you look at one of the example pieces I cut here, where I just cut a straight tenon with it, this actually goes right in here like this and it holds it in and then all this does is hold it very straight and level as you pass it through the blade like that and it cuts the edge then you flip it around and clamp the other side in and it because of the way it holds it it cuts these tenons very symmetrically um, now the only trick is you have to have a saw blade with flat teeth. In other words, when you look at most normal saw blades, I know I'm getting off the microphone here. If you look at these saw blades, I don't know if you could see it up close, but if you notice they alternate. So this tooth is angled kind of this direction, then the next tooth is angled this direction, then this direction, then this direction. They angle back and forth. And the purpose for those teeth doing that is it it actually helps cut the wood smoother especially when you're doing a or more smoothly when you're doing a cross cut now let me put this away the teeth on this saw blade are all flat and because of that they leave a really flat edge on them Whereas if you use those other ones with the alternating teeth, it'll actually put a little groove in there. And then when the, when the joint fits together, uh, you'll see that little notch. So it will work, but it's a little neater that way. So anyway, once we cut those, then these fit together very nicely and it holds everything at a 90 degree angle. So it'll be nice and square. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just glue those together once we get them glued together we'll be almost finished with this project uh, all we'll have to do is cut the slotted parts that go into up here and we should be ready to see what our cover looks like so uh, that's the update and when we get things to the next step here we'll be right back okay so we have the top all finished I cut the little tongue on the sides there to fit in the dado and I just glued it up and you can see I have these little side pieces fitted in and here is a little idea the lighting's not real good in here to see but here's an idea of what it's going to look like I put some of the finish on there that I'm going to be using we'll talk about the finish here once we get the clamps off and everything dries but I think it's going to look really nice I really do all right We'll be back when this dries. 
Okay, it's all dry and it's ready to put the finish on. So let's talk a little bit about this finish. I am not going to put a traditional uh, polyurethane or something like that on it. I'm actually going to use this stuff. It's not a real heavily protective. In other words, it's not like using like a catalyzed lacquer or something that puts like a hard shell finish on it. But rather, this is an oil type finish. It has uh, paraffin oil, lemon oil, uh, paraffin wax I should say, lemon oil, uh, there's some uh, mineral spirits and a few other types of things. It's designed to soak into the wood and then kind of put a kind of a soft finish that really feels nice and smooth and silky. The other nice thing about it is it can be reapplied very easily with a rag. It smells really nice. It smells like lemon oil, just like lemons. And with this type of wood, Paduk wood actually has a lot of natural oils within it. And one of the problems is getting stains or varnishes to stick to it that are not oil based. Um, it tends to mix with the natural oils in here. So you have to use mineral spirits and alcohol and things to try to clean the oil off. Even when you're gluing this, you need to kind of wipe the glue off. I know I'm cutting my head off here <laughs> um, to get to it. So this is a really good finish. And as you can see on this little piece of scrap wood, it gives it a beautiful color. And what will happen is as this wood ages, this grain pattern will darken to kind of a uh, an orangish dark brown color. It's really nice looking. And it just gets softer and smoother with age. So this will be a beautiful finish for this cabinet. Uh, especially since this isn't like a table or a chair or something that's going to be handled all the time. It's going to be sitting on a shelf. And you're typically not going to be putting, hopefully you won't put your beer on it or anything. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to put the finish on it. We're going to take a final look at it and then we'll get it uh, installed on the amplifier. And we'll see how it looks. Well, I hope the light is catching this properly. Look at how it turned out. Wow. Really nice coloring to it. It's still wet a little bit and as it cures it'll kind of get more of a satin sheen to it and uh, but I think it turned out really well that's why I like this paduk wood it's very good it's very durable it doesn't crack it doesn't warp um, because it does have oil in it and so forth it tends to stay really nice for a long time you don't have to really worry about putting really hard acrylic you know type finishes on it so I think this is gonna give a real nice accent to that receiver so we're gonna have a nice looking 2500 Marantz <laughs> hopefully so next we'll see this uh, installed on the receiver we'll give the receiver another little test drive and send it back home to its owner I guess well there it is all done and I think it turned out pretty nice actually get a little bit of a frontal view here kinda go around the side a little bit look at that not bad so well, it was a lot of work, and if you remember the basket case this thing was when it first came in in the first video, I think we made quite an improvement. So, uh, everything's playing nicely. It's doing really well, and uh, I think this, was, this one's all done. The hum is gone. The bad looking beat up case is gone and everything's fully restored. So hopefully we'll have a happy owner now. And I know I'm a lot happier now than, uh, than when this left my bench the first time. So, all right, until next time, peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. 
I have a uh, little portable shortwave radio we're going to do. It's an old tube one. It's a classic one. And then I have a whole bunch of amplifier receiver <laughs> videos coming up. So I uh, hang in there. Uh, work is still extraordinarily busy. So as, as you know, I'm only getting little tiny bits of time uh, to work on this. So bear with me and we'll be doing a lot more here later on as the, as the year goes by here. All right. Thank you all and see you soon. Bye-bye.